This is the firstborn class, and um, uh, we were last in um, uh, Genesis 17 and verse 9 through 11, I think, yep. <clears throat> and um, I don't know how this class is going to go because I've been thinking about some things in relationship to this. Um, and um, <clears throat> it's, I, I, I kind of saw it in these scriptures. Um, let's see. Okay, so verses uh, 9 through 11 says, <clears throat> And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. Okay, uh, that was the, the first signal. Uh, this is God talking, and this is God talking to Abraham, and this is, this, is the, this is in relationship to the covenant that Galatians is just full of. It talks about Abraham, the covenant God made with Abraham, uh, and that that's the new covenant. Um, and so, just this... One phrase particularly, every man child among you shall be circumcised. And then verse 11, and you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant between me and you. And uh, we talked about that somewhat. <clears throat> um, and I think in the last class we talked about... <clears throat> that this covenant is to be in our flesh and that this is a sign. This is like a token or a sign to God from our side of the covenantal relations that we're with him, that we're with him. And, um, and then last class we... Um, we kind of, you know, centered more on the fact of <clears throat> this covenant being in our flesh, not just being in our spirit, not just being um, uh, the thing that we have faith in, but rather that there be a token of that in our flesh, a sign of it in our flesh, um, a sign of the cross, a sign of the cutting away of the flesh, okay? And so what we also did was that we went to 2 Corinthians 4, 5, and it won't hurt us to read that again. 2 Corinthians 4, 5, and the reason why we went there was because we wanted to see a New Testament example of, of uh, circumcision in our flesh. But this time, because you know, there are obvious places in, in Colossians and, and other places, where it talks, it literally uses the word circumcision uh, and relating to us. And it's, you know, that it, those are great scriptures. <clears throat> but these scriptures, while they don't mention circumcision, keep talking about like the mark of the cross in our flesh. More than that, the actual working of that as a sign in our flesh. So with that in mind, let's read it again. 2 Corinthians, starting with verse, uh, 2 Corinthians 4, starting with verse 5. For we preach not ourselves, okay? So this is, this is a sign that something has been cut away. But Christ Jesus, the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. But with all of that glory and all of that seeing and all of that revelation and all of that great stuff going on, it says, but we have this treasure, the actual thing in us, but it describes us as an earthen vessel. 
Okay. Us as an, an earthen vessel. Okay. But, but, we now we've seen it and it's glorious, but this thing's got to be seen in our flesh is basically where he's going with this. So he's talking about revealing himself and seeing him in all of his glory and we're seeing the God side and then he puts the our side in that covenantal relationship with him. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God, not of us. Okay, so there is a power of God that he wants real working in us. Okay, so then he says, um, so the next verse, verse 8, we are troubled on, the earthen vessel is troubled, but we have this treasure. This is the whole point of the treasure in earthen vessel. We, see, Christians go, oh, praise God, I'm a vessel of Jesus. I'm a vessel of Jesus. And, and uh, they go off on that and they never, never read the next verse that, well, guess what? There's this process that the earthen vessel goes through that the excellency of the power may sh may not be us because we're uh, troubled and uh, vexed and distressed and persecuted and uh, forsaken or cast down, but um, but there's a there is a power that is of God that can be shown not just in an earthen vessel, meaning that we were made of clay a long time ago, but that we are weakened vessel. In fact, I think I did a translation of this and I think that's what I used. I used the word weakened vessels in the sense of uh, cast down, we're, not, we're troubled, we're cast down, we're distressed, you know, all these things that are going on, but there's still strength, but it's not ours, if you will. There's still power, we still have a power, but it's not ours, it's not ours, okay? so. Then he, he goes through that little part, verse 8 and 9. And then in verse 10, without even stopping, you know, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. Okay. And uh, he's talking about bearing it in the body. And he's talking about, now here comes the power. The power isn't that we're, we're uh, uh, this, you know, we're persecuted but not forsaken. That's not the power. The power is that we're bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. Okay, so this is like a picture of, of uh, circumcision. This is us being cut out of the thing and him becoming the life, but the life is a self-giving life, you know? Uh, 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 I'm trying to think of the scripture, I think it is in Hebrews, it talks about that, that, that this is a self-giving life. And th it is, because it's, a, it's lamb life. And so, um, so then, so he starts, he explains the weakness that brings the vessel down to being earthen, which is the junk that's going on in the earth. But then he explains the power and the power actually also is weaker than the weakness that we have in our vessel. It's the weakness of the lamb, the weakness that that God Almighty with all power didn't just wipe everybody out or wipe out his enemies. And, you know, he opened the door for whosoever will to be able to come regardless. Didn't matter. Well, to have that at work in us is power because we're very prejudiced or we're very um, have preconceived notions of what we like and what we don't like you know and um, so um, that the life also of, of Jesus might be made manifest in our body the life of Jesus in our body there it is this is the circumcision now that that cross has affected us to such a degree that the life now of Jesus can come forth out of an earthen vessel. Even, see, he didn't, and what's funny in this is, well, you may not think it's funny, but he didn't strengthen the vessel and then put himself in us, you know? And, and we think that way a lot, I think. I, I think we do. I think we kind of go, 
you know, Lord, strengthen me and I will be a better vessel and I will go, I will be all that you want. And, you know, Lord, just strengthen me. And he comes along and he goes, well, that's really not the way I work. I'm going to weaken you, you know. I'm going to let all these things hit you. And while you won't be destroyed, you'll be, you know, cast down or whatever, you know. But then my life, because you're not doing it, trying to do it, trying to be it, trying to attain to it, trying to become something, uh, because you're so weak that it's like, you know, I, I, hey, I'm just lucky that I'm, uh, you know, I may be trouble on every side, but I'm not just like distressed. I'm not freaking out. That's not the power of God. That's, that's, that's the thing that God's doing to weaken us a little more as we go. Now, you know, this harkens back to the first couple of verses of this chapter. Um, the, the chapters before, um, Abraham had, and Sarah got together and decided with Hagar that they were going to produce uh, the seed. And so Hagar got pregnant, and so she brings forth Ishmael. And so God doesn't talk to Abraham for 13 years. Okay? Now that would be, you know, how's it, how's it going with y'all? <laughs> Hope it hadn't been 13 years or there's an Ishmael hiding somewhere. Anyway, la, la, la. Um, but, <laughs> but then God does appear. And he says, I am almighty God. And, there, you know, there's two meanings to that. One is literally that, that the, this is the all-sufficient one. The all, all resources are at his disposal, not you. So stop, to Abraham, trying to do it, be it, perform it, or make it come to pass. And then the other one was the... the glorious nurse meaning a nursing mother and we talked about all of that and that you know back then they didn't go down to the 7-eleven and get a jar of milk you drew from your mother and this is god as the glorious nurse who is is filling us with the things that are in him and it is nutrient rich i mean i don't know if you you know see i I remember when nursing wasn't, you know, looked down on by some people. I mean, I, I, Deb nursed, and I thought it was beautiful, but, you know, nursing babies get really chubby and rolls and everything, not because they're fat or overfed or anything, but because the nourishment is so incredible that they just are pink and alive and all this kind of stuff. And some of you ladies out there know what I'm talking about. Um, you very seldom see a really skinny nursing baby. Uh, well, that's as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. We shouldn't be skinny. There's no way we should be skinny. <clears throat> Sorry for jumping over in First Peter. <clears throat> um, so he appears to him and he's ex he's explaining to him this. But then he says, but. I want us to be in covenant. And so he starts laying this out and he starts talking about circumcision. And, and circumcision um, being in our flesh, being assigned to God, as it were. Uh, there's so many things that I'd love to jump off on this. Um, and, and maybe I should, because I was thinking about it today. I was thinking about circumcision. I was thinking about um, the, uh, well, let me take one more step back. And y'all remind me that I was thinking about circumcision in, re in regards to Exodus, uh, the, the Exodus. Um, I was thinking about uh, the prodigal son, which is where this whole thing started. I don't know what number are we on. And that's not even, that doesn't even go through Exodus and prodigal son and all that. <clears throat> but that's where the Lord first started showing me that, that the prodigal son was weakened and this prodigal son had messed up. And, you know, you go, okay, well, there's no hope for that guy. But the son was still in him. The son was in him and his 
as long as he thought he was the son, there was a problem. And then he would do things that proved that he wasn't the son. In other words, there was no sign or token of the covenant in his flesh. There was no death. There was no crucifixion. There was no circumcision. But then the son comes back with, all, you know, I am not worthy. I, you know, I mean, you know, we're, again, we're trying to go, oh, God, just strengthen this vessel and I'll be, I'll be such a good Christian and I'll be everything you want. Okay, yeah, no, you won't. Stop praying like that. Start praying, Lord, fill me with your son and do whatever it takes. We always get afraid of that. So if you don't want to pray that, then say, uh, just kill me anyway. Uh, so, in this, um, so, so this son is in the, the prodigal son. And, and so the, the father starts putting elements on him, the robe and the ring and all of these things that basically say you're the firstborn. That, I mean, that goes all the way through the Bible. It's basically saying you're the firstborn, okay? But, you know, it needs to be, that sign needs to be in your flesh, okay? Well, okay, so here's where I'm going with this. So you have the, you have two sons, but one is a firstborn son, and that was the prodigal son, but it wasn't him that was the firstborn, it was the firstborn in him. The other was not really a son. He was a tiknon, uh, which is a, a Greek word used. Maybe we'll look at that. Um, that. That the father went to him when he wouldn't come in and called him child. Okay, here's part of, of what I was thinking about. I'm not saying all this is right, so you be the judge. But I was thinking about, here's the fact that the elder son is in the family, but he's really not a firstborn. Okay, well, we kind of we kind of know that, right? We kind of know that. We kind of got that. Okay, so then I took it to Exodus. So here we are at Exodus. <clears throat> I was thinking about Exodus, and I was thinking about when Moses got ready to go down into Egypt to, 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 for, you know, to do what God wanted him to do. God said to him, you know, go down and tell Pharaoh, you know, I want my firstborn. Um, so um, he gets down there, and there's this whole process that God says, and it, and it doesn't have anything to do with just go down there and show Pharaoh some miracles and get the people, get my people out of there. He actually set up this whole thing that it would all be about the firstborn. And basically that's it. It's all about the firstborn. And uh, I'm sure I've got stuff in here on that. <clears throat> but, uh, but the point being that um, God wants his firstborn and his firstborn is going to be in relationship to circumcision or this token is going to be in our flesh, which will be the cross whereby the firstborn that really is the firstborn, not that we are. The one who's the firstborn in us will come forth. So, so the, he sets up this whole thing. Well, the lamb died for the firstborn. Okay? For the firstborn. And the blood was put on the doorpost to show the death angel that this represents the firstborn that, that God has. In other words, this wasn't the, the token in their flesh yet. This was the token from the lamb giving himself. Okay. But I thought, I mean, it just came to me that, huh, you know, maybe that blood is a sign, a, a picture of circumcision in the sense that there was, um, that there was a death uh, and this, this represents the token that's supposed to be manifest in the firstborn when God brings them out. Now, we've been through the whole story. I don't want to go through that whole thing. But um, so I was thinking of all of that in relationship back now to Abraham and Isaac. So let's go to verse 12 and 14 so I can, I can uh, kind of touch on the verses there that I wanted to mention. 
<clears throat> this is uh, back uh, Genesis 17 verses 12 through 14. <clears throat> and he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Every man child, every man child in your generations, he that is born in the house, there it is, he that is born in the house, or bought with money, or any stranger which is not of thy seed, which is not of thy seed, he that is born in the house, the, uh, and he that is bought with money, must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the circumcised man-child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. Okay. I was thinking about this in relationship to um, what I've just mentioned with the prodigal son and what I just mentioned with Esther. And that is that he's saying all of everybody in your house, which basically would be your family, everybody, every male child, you have to be circumcised, whether you're firstborn or not. You have to be circumcised. Okay? Meaning they're in the family then. But uh, that circumcision goes across the board for all, firstborn, anybody else. But the way that he words this is he says that, uh, um, and he that is eight days old and shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations, which is not of thy seed. Okay, so here was my thought, and I'm just pondering it. But I think that he sees his seed different from just Israel that was delivered, from just the elder son that is still part of the family, from just um, uh, uh, Ishmael, Jacob, the other brothers, that, he, that there is a difference. And the difference is that there, is, there has to be an application of the cross to everybody. Okay, you get this in Galatians, to everybody. But there is something more than an application of the cross that God is after. Well, I'm saved. I believe in the cross. I did it and I, all that kind of stuff. Well, you know, in that sense then, and, and the way I'm talking, well, I don't doubt your salvation, but I doubt that the firstborn is alive and moving in you and is that son that the father wants, the seed. And that's the whole mess up of Abraham through this whole thing is he didn't know the right seed and he kept offering at God the wrong seed. And guess what? That these things are supposed to be things to teach us that we're trying to offer him our good ideas, our, our helpfulness, our uh, willingness, our all this kind of stuff. Well, okay. Uh, I'm sure everybody in the family can work towards the family goal. But the, isn't it, it's not a family goal. It's not a Christian goal. Ultimately, it is what the firstborn can be and give unto the Father through us, which is more than just a sign of circumcision in our flesh. It is the Son. Now, I know all this could sound a little weird, and here's, here's what I want to say with that. Uh, my intention of sharing this in no way <clears throat> is to take the general population of the body of Christ, I see all the people, and to say, okay, there's a special group over here, and you're special, and you're not. That's not my purpose, because the truth is, the, those who have the firstborn in them, they're not special they're actually less than special in the sense that they're um, cast down, but not for saying they're all, they're, they're bearing all of this in their body in a completely different way. They are bearing the dying of the Lord Jesus through them. It's not, 
See, it's not about death. It's about death that brings forth life. And it's not about our death. It's about bearing about in our bodies his death that would bring forth life. So there's nothing special about us. I'm, you know, the only glory goes to the Lamb of God, to the firstborn son that understands this is what I was made for. You know, there was, there's a, I don't know where, Yeah, I've, I've got it right here. <clears throat> so when they came out of Egypt, God said, now, now when you, you know, you, when you start having the Passover, your sons, you know, I want you to tell them what the deal is. And this is uh, Exodus 13 verse, this is Exodus 13, 14 and 15, 13 verses 14 and 15. And it shall be when thy son asketh thee in time to come saying, what is this? That thou shalt say unto him, By strength of hand the Lord uh, brought us out from Egypt, from the house of bondage. And it came to pass, when Pharaoh would hardly let us go, that the Lord slew all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of men and the firstborn of beasts. Therefore I sacrifice to the Lord all that opened the matrix, the womb, uh, being males, but all the firstborn of my children I redeem. And the redemption there is that... that uh, at this stage, the redemption there is that something else dies in its place. But God wants the firstborn. Not He doesn't just want the firstborn son to come to earth once, die for us, and then we live different from that. He wants that same firstborn son formed in us so that we can manifest that. Okay? And so... Um, so if a person was worried about salvation over these kind of teachings or whatever, there's nothing to worry about. The question is, do we, do we grasp his heart? Do we sense his, his deep desire uh, in all of this? Um, let my firstborn come to me and sacrifice. And that's really what these verses are talking about, that that's it. Um, um, Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord all that opens the womb. That spirit was meant to be carried on. Now, we know that from previous classes in Exodus. But, so I started looking at some verses in Galatians. Um, let's see. Well, let me make sure here. Uh, Galatians 3, starting with verse 25. Um, and so what this is going to sound like, let's see. This is going to set it up where um, that we're all, we're all in, we're all in the, you know, we're all of God. Uh, we even might have circumcision in our flesh. Uh, in the true meaning of that. Um, and that, so it says, but after that, after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster, but we are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you has been baptized into Christ, children of God. Now that's not a mature son. Um, baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Um, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus, for you are all one in Him. And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Okay, so that last verse, verse 29, um, threw me a little bit because it says, but if you're Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. But I started, because I'm thinking that the seed is, Abraham's seed is Isaac. It is Jacob. This is the firstborn. This is the seed. This is what he's talking about, is Joseph, okay? And in all of those, we, feed, we see major manifestations of the firstborn son, okay? So, 
that kind of threw me for a second. And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to this promise. But whoever did this Bible thing um, made a chapter separation there and thought he was going to another subject when I think that this verse, because they didn't, well, weren't numbered and anything else, people put those in, that this verse was setting up the next verse. Okay, so now listen to this. Okay, so we're saying, we're, uh, I'm saying, and you don't have to believe what I'm saying, but it's, I think there's really something to this, um, that, um, uh, that in God's heart, uh, Isaac was the seed, counted as the seed, and Ishmael was in the family because he was. Then he got circumcised too. You know that, I'm sure. So did Esau. Yeah, because why? Because they were in the family and God told everyone that's in the family needs to be circumcised. But they didn't have the spirit of this thing. Okay? So, um, so he's saying, so let me read it like verse 29 going right into chapter 4 verse 1. And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. All right. So this thing went from being an heir and being in the family and we're all children of God by faith to the father wanting the son. You know what's coming. You know what's about to come. Okay, um, uh, verse 4, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. He already said we were all in the family. He already said that we are, you know, we have faith and that, you know, that sort of thing. But now he's saying, um, that, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Now listen to the next words. And because you are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out by Father. That's, that's, much, that's not salvation. That's not in the family. That's a, that's a fullness of time that can come in you, in me. God is no respecter of persons. That we, we, Lay down our, 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 I'm sure I'll get in trouble for this, lay down our Christianity and take up the Son, not just Christ. Take up, and you could even say lay down Christ as the Messiah or whatever, as the Savior that saved us all. That's, that's secure. We don't have to worry about that. We don't have to make it happen. It's already happened. But to begin to come to a fullness of time, to not miss his visitation, to not miss the timing of the Lord when he wants that this time, at this time, to begin to reveal that son in us whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And it's a whole relationship. Listen to that relationship. It's a relationship between the Father and the Son. It's not even us being special. It's not us um, above or exalted or thought more of in fact in a sense less because the firstborns will be the first ones to lay down their life because the firstborn lives in us and will give himself in that way okay so um so that that spirit of adoption i mean i i i, I think i saw it in relationship to uh, the prodigal son that spirit of adoption and, and he's crying. I can just hear him. I mean, they do the sacrifice and all that, and then they make merry, and they're just in there just dancing. And it's, it's, the, it's the father and his son, his firstborn son, that's filling that relationship now, even though that son had been in the family for a long time and only treated himself like a family member. I'm, you know, we're all the... Um, but after faith, faith for salvation has come, for you're all the children, the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Now I mentioned mature sons because this is, you know this, but um, 
Galatians 4 says you're no longer a tignon, a child, um, and you don't, you don't really, in a sense, you're no different than a servant, though really you are Lord of all, but you're not that, and you just haven't come to the time when that son comes forth. Okay, and uh, well, in the prodigal son story, I'm sure you remember, when I got to it, I was shocked when, uh, in the Greek, it says that when the elder son would not come out, that the father had to go out to that son, coax him in, come on, come in, come in, you know, come in, you know, and and come in, come into this spirit and come into more than just being in it. Well, I've been at the family this whole time. I've served you without, you know, all this kind of stuff. Well, when he spoke, when the father spoke to him, he said, uh, I think in the, the King James, it might even say son, but if you look it up, it's tignon. It's this word right here. It's child. You haven't come to the place where you have been cast down and uh, all these things have gone through you. And your earthen vessel is so prepared now because you have no power so that he's able to introduce a whole new kind of power. The power of a laid down life, the power of the cross, the power of all of that to be able to work in you. But it doesn't work by teaching the subjects of the power of a laid down life or the power of the cross. It comes by the firstborn son, God sending him forth into our hearts. And we start crying, Abba, Father, not, not by us, but by him. Abba, Father, that's a very intimate word. And so, um, so I, you know, I don't know. I could be crazy. Uh, I think that I'm on to something here. But, and the main thing that I'm talking about being on to is I think I'm on to the fact that when God spoke of Abraham's seed, he meant of the direct line of this son coming forth. He didn't just mean anybody that came into the family. Now, anybody that came into the family, they needed to get circumcised or you're just like the heathen out there. But there's more to the firstborn and you see it in Isaac and you see it and you may not fully see it in Jacob who becomes Israel, by the way, yet you may not see it, but God willing, we'll get to that. And when we do, you will see the firstborn in Jacob. And it will be beautiful. And you won't, you will, your heart will melt to see what this firstborn son has done in somebody like Jacob. That's why throughout the prophets and everything, all these places, when it talks about Jacob, you know, there's always hope because if there was hope for Jacob, then there's hope for us. Well, hope for what? Salvation? No, Jacob was in the family. And he wasn't even in line. Neither, neither was, if you will, Isaac wasn't in line for being the firstborn either because Ishmael was born before him and Esau was born before Jacob. And on and on and on. Uh, Cain was born before Abel, but all of them, all of them. I mean, it's like Jacob is in that womb trying to be the firstborn, grabbing his heel, and, uh, <laughs> you know, grabbing Esau's heel. There's something in him and that wants the firstborn thing, the life of, the, of Jesus in that spiritual way, in that wonderful way. So anyway, we're going to stop. I just hope that's a blessing to you and I hope it helps you to see um, from God's heart when it comes to the firstborn. Yeah, praise God. He's got a big family. He's got a big family. And we're all, all the churches that are, where they're truly born again. And we're all in that. And we can love one another. And we're all one in Christ. That's what it says. Even though, you know, whatever. But 
but there's things in the heart of God that's beyond our happiness and our um, the blessings that we have uh, by being in the family. Uh, you're an heir, but you're you haven't really got the inheritance yet. The inheritance, which is the fullness of His Son. Hallelujah. So I want to just pray for you, and I'm I just. I want, I want us to start to hunger for something so much beyond um, those, the, these Christian things that we're so happy with. And it's just get out of us and just say, okay, Father, there's a relationship between you and the Son that you want us to be kind of the lightning rod of that, you know, between you, y'all too. So that we can, like the prodigal son, go in and start dancing too when he's, no, he's still a prodigal. But now he's let the firstborn come for it, the one the father always wanted. So let's pray. Father, we just, we just seek your face and your heart. Father, I'm just always so inadequate to, to communicate your heart. How can I communicate your heart? Only by the Holy Spirit. Father, how can I help people to be moved more for you during this great time of visitation? I can't. But I cry out for it. I long for it for your sake and your son's sake and the, and, the, and the reality of this thing that you've always longed after. Father, I always hesitate to even share like this for fear that somebody will start saying, well, that we're the firstborns and therefore we start acting like we're something special and we're better than regular Christians and all that. And Father, that is an abomination unto you. It is Christ. It is your Son. It is the firstborn. Father, that if anyone read Colossians or many of the other scriptures in the New Testament listing the firstborn, they would see how high and how exalted He is. But Father... You want that same son in every one of us so that we would be a, such a, a vessel, an earthen vessel, a broken vessel, that we would not be a hindrance to his nature and his way and his directions. So, Father, please draw us, draw us more into not these words or these teachings. They're all a failure unless your spirit is with us. Draw us in to this union, this relationship, this oneness between you, Father, and your Son in this manner. I just pray for that. I just, I just cover all of us that hunger for these things. I just cover us by whatever authority or ever covering you've been able to give me as a minister so that we could, could spend our time grasping and growing and loving and finding new and new means and measures. Father, thank you that we could even pray, that we could even pray for these things. Thank you. You're a good father but you're a better father to your son and that's who I want coming for. So thank you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Um, I don't know. I just don't have words. I just, I just love you and I just long after you your precious hearts, your precious hearts that do want the Lord. Mm, may the Lord give me the ability to just give you a little more push in, in that direction. Thank you for being on with us. Amen. God bless you.